Friends, I just want to say at the start that I have the utmost respect for all of you, even though I don't, I don't know you, because you're here, you preach, you want to be encouraged and strengthened in your preaching, and Amy and I were just reflecting earlier, I, I get emotional when I think about it, because nobody ever should have given me an opportunity, you know, in, on paper, I was like a young, new Christian, came out of a very just dark life, and yet people saw what God was doing in my life, and very early on, not in an inappropriate time frame or anything, there was enough of a you know, track record there, but still my gift set was like untested, but I was given opportunities. People took a step of faith to give me the right kind of opportunities, and to this day, I'm so grateful for that, because I was just some like dumb kid from the San Francisco Bay Area. I never, to this day, even with all the different, you know, talking about the different experiences, it's amazing, but I still feel like that little kid from the Bay Area. I'm like, if it were not for the Spirit of God and my confidence in the Word of God, like, I would not do this. I could not even get up in front of a microphone, or at least not without alcohol when I was younger, you know, but now I'm like, I've got something to say. And I didn't plan on sharing this, but as we get into this, the two contrasting experiences for me was right before I became a Christian, one of my friends tragically died. He was like a childhood friend. And we did a memorial service, and they went around asking everyone, well, what would you like to say about this man Shane's life and where, he, where you think he is? And nobody knew what to say. And I remember it came to me, and I said, I have no idea what to say. Fast forward one year later, I became a Christian. And then another year later, my father died. And the first time I ever preached was at my own father's funeral in front of some of my old friends. But this time I had something to say. And I had courage and I had boldness because I was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the same message that you're entrusted with. And I want to start this morning with the why of preaching. We're going to learn a lot about the how. Sarah's going to talk about character Amy's going to talk about the capability, the practicalities. Pete's going to talk about preaching the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Josh is going to be, where's Josh? He's going to be the wild card. It's going to be amazing. Um, (laughs) But I want to start with the why. The world is already preaching. The world is preaching something. The world needs the gospel to be preached. And God commands us to preach. But when we teach, whatever opportunity it is, whether it's in your local church or a university or it's a lunchtime study in the city, whatever it is, what are we preaching? And just to begin to set some context, I think this, is this thing on? This thing on? I want to read from the familiar passage of Luke chapter 24. Now, on the same day, two of them were walking to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing? Or I like some translations say, what are you talking about? together as you walk along. It's a beautiful moment. I think we all know and love in the Gospels, not recognizing who was walking next to them. These disciples explained their struggle with what seemed to be the failed messianic mission of Jesus that they had been following. And yet, with words that we'll explore in more detail throughout the day, Jesus redirects their conversation back to Scripture and back to himself. He says, I I love the words of Jesus here, how foolish you are and slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. I bring this up at the beginning of our time together because I think Christ's question to them on that day is an important question to us in our day. What are you talking about? What are you preaching about? 
It's a wonderfully loaded question for these disciples headed to Emmaus, the place that some historians speculate would have been the next best location to find an alternative Messiah since Jesus had clearly failed in their view. So Jesus, whatever the reason, disguised from their view, clearly asks this question to draw them out, a teachable moment, if you will, where he takes them back to Scripture and back to himself. Good preaching always does this. Brings us back to the Word of God and back to Christ. And so again, let's ask the question, what have we been preaching about? Well, Jesus, we've been mainly talking about politics, expounding on political theory and which leaders are the true representation of the kingdom of God on earth. Well, Jesus, we've been mainly talking about global affairs, examining the nuances of foreign policies and speculating the future of all nations. Well, Jesus, we've been mainly talking about psychology, brain rewiring, health and wellness, and whether or not the Enneagram should be included alongside the creeds in the Westminster Catechism. (laughs) I jest, but I, I think I've addressed all these topics in sermons. And some of them, of course, do call for pastoral attention but they should never be mistaken for the primary responsibility of the preacher. We desperately need to return to the word of God and expose the truth of God's word to every heart. That's what expository preaching is all about. To quote one of the classic books on preaching, John Stott, Between Two Worlds, his definition is this. To expound scripture is to bring out of the text what is there and expose it to view. The expositor opens what appears to be closed, makes plain what is obscure, unravels what is knotted, and unfolds what is tightly packed. That's expository teaching. It's less about the style of a talk. That's not what we're thinking about today. It's more about the content of your talk. And in a cultural moment where, and I'm sure you feel this, where there's daily, if not hourly pressure to respond to every current event, every hot topic, or even personal preferences, there is a danger that we end up with a distorted view of the Bible. And as a result, a distorted view of God. Oftentimes, if I can be honest, the emphasis can be on the personality of the teacher. The spectacle of a service. The relevance of a topic. Or perhaps the routine of tradition as the driving force. Now let me be clear. We should want to grow in our ability to communicate. That's, I think, why you're here. We want to work hard and praying for and thinking about how we order our services. And there are times that we certainly need to address the need of the moment. Times where we need to have discernment and a prophetic voice. And there is a beauty in the rhythms of church history. But I would argue that expository teaching, that we're focusing on the Bible, should be the regular diet of the church. It should be the regular diet diet of the church. So I just want to give us five reasons why you should focus on the text. Five reasons why you should focus on the text. Why not just give a great TED talk? Why not just share great anecdotal stories? And sometimes those elements are included in your talk, but why should we focus on on the Bible? Why should we open a Bible in front of other people and say, what I'm about to say to you comes from and is focused on the Bible? Here are five reasons. Number one, focusing on the text displays Scripture's inspiration. When you open a Bible and say, I'm going to give a talk in whatever context it might be, you are showing 
to other people that you believe this is the divinely inspired word of God. It's not a piece of good advice. It's not a philosophy. It's not a great idea. It is the living and active word of God brought to bear on the human heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. You're showing that when you open a Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, Paul writes, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We convey the conviction that all of Scripture is inspired by our willingness to teach from a variety of passages in the Bible and not just cherry pick. How easy it is, Amy and I were just chatting, when you, if you get invited to do a conference, um, oftentimes you're given a passage to teach on. And that's a great challenge, because otherwise you just want to play the hits. You're like, oh, I got like three. I got three passages I love. Oh, I just, I, man, I just smash it when I do this one passage. You're like, oh, here, do an obscure passage from Ecclesiastes. And you're like, okay, okay. But you should embrace that opportunity willingly. Why? Because when you do so, you're showing that all Scripture, not just some of Scripture, all Scripture is God-breathed. And as you draw out the meaning of each text and you make your appeals on the basis of the text and work through a variety of biblical texts, we are building confidence in the hearts of our hearers that all Scripture is inspired by God. Amen? By the way, when I say amen, it's not a rhetorical question, so you can just say amen. <laughs> I used to, I've, I've found in my experience that some passages that I might normally leave out because I feel shy or like, ugh, they actually produce some of the most remarkable fruit. I remember um, going through when I was um, pastoring in LA, we went through the book of Hosea. Now, Jose, oh, everyone loves the first three chapters. There's not a lot of love for the rest of the book. Because <laughs> it gets into like the judgment against sin, you know. And I remember we're going to go through Jose and everybody loves just the drama of the first three chapters. The story, you're like, oh. And then chapter three, you're like, let's go to John. <laughs> but I remember we were committed. We're like, we're going to do Jose. And it was so good that we did. It formed and shaped how people understand, understood who God was and how he viewed sin, but how he graciously made a way for sinners to be forgiven. I also remember teaching through the book of Ecclesiastes, which is actually turns out to be one of my favorite books. Love it. It was one of the first books I read when I was a new Christian. I'm like, this guy gets me. It's like all this vanity. I'm like, oh, yes, that's how I feel. But then at the end, there's like this turn. You're like, oh, wait, he's showing the true meaning of life. I love this. By teaching a variety of biblical passages, we are showing that all Scripture is inspired. I used to tell our team in, in L.A. that we, we don't want people to be surprised. If they've been coming to our church, if people are coming to hear from you and whatever ministry it is that you have, Let's say you have a year with them. You don't want them to go home and open the Bible and be surprised by what they read. Right? You want to expose them to as much scripture as possible so that they know that it's all inspired. We also believe that the word works in our hearts as illuminated by the Holy Spirit. We're going to learn more about that later. Because the Bible is not just about information, but transformation. As Hebrews says, living and active. God's power in verbal form. Isn't that amazing that you are all engaged in the act of preaching the word of God? Whenever I, I, I go to preach, I'm, I'm always so, how many of you still get nervous no matter how long you're, you're doing it? I preached yesterday at Reality London and, you know, this, I was kind of on the side of the stage and one of the volunteers was like, do you still get nervous? And I was like, it's been 25 years since I'm preaching and I still feel like I want to vomit. Every time. There's a sense in which I feel so inadequate. But what gets me up there is like, this is the word of God. This isn't about me. I have so much confidence in God's word. Without this confidence and conviction in scripture, you know what happens? 
we tend to overemphasize our own personal experience. Or perhaps a particular tradition as the source of our confidence. Again, your testimony is important. Our rhythms and traditions are important. But we should never mistake them as the ultimate authority. What would hinder you from preaching all of Scripture? It really exposes your own sensibilities, where you're most tempted to cherry pick the topics that you don't really want to talk about. When you commit to focusing on the text, you are showing that all of Scripture is inspired and profitable. And if we believe that, then we will display this as we take care to explain and expose the text. Not just the parts that we like or are comfortable with, which leads to the second value. Number two, why should we open the Bible and focus on the text? Focusing on the text sets the agenda. So number one, when we do it, we're displaying that all Scripture is inspired. Number two, Scripture sets the agenda. When we focus on it, we show that to be true. Paul, when he spent time with the Ephesian leaders, he ended by saying in Acts chapter 20, verse 27, For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. If you know the story, Paul had a limited amount of time with those men and women. He had priorities. He wanted to communicate the whole counsel of God. So committing to the text, the passage, the paragraph, the chapter, the book, is a way of submitting yourself to where Scripture takes you. Yes, you still need to prayerfully consider what passage you will preach. Your preaching team, um, many of you are on these preaching teams, you still need to pray and ask for the Spirit's guidance about what series you're going to do, what books you might engage in in this season. But even within each book, And within each passage, there are all kinds of themes and topics that arise that you may not have anticipated. And sometimes I find myself surprised at the ways in which the topics or themes arise in that book are so powerful in ways that I did not expect. They weren't the ones I was thinking of when I had this great idea to do a series through whatever book that might be. Otherwise, we're left to our own preferences or maybe just the desire of the people that you teach. Again, I think there's a great benefit and a time for addressing a cultural moment. But again, the diet, the regular pattern should be that the text sets the agenda. It can help us resist the pressure to only address certain topics while avoiding others. Let me just give you one example My experience in L.A. for those 10 years, we had a predominantly uh, younger church. And I was asked every week to teach on, you know, in this case with our growing church, it was predominantly single at the time. And so I was asked to teach regularly on singleness. And so I would kind of favor texts that would talk about, you know, career and, you know, just kind of living life in that particular stage. But... When I would come to the marriage text, our church realized how essential it was for their theology, their understanding of their relationship with God, the whole narrative of the Bible, and ultimately Christ and the church. And it helped them learn how to minister to and appreciate those who were married. I couldn't just favor what the demand was of the congregation. Let me put it this way. In short, we should let the text control our talks, not our talks control the text. That's the important thing. That's what we must remember. So which topics are we most prone to avoid? On the other hand, which topics are you most prone to overkill? Like everyone knows and they've listened, I see a few, a few nodding heads. Like, like, oh, there he goes again. There she goes again. That's, that's his thing. That's her thing. Like seven times a year, we're going to hear this thing. And of course, you know, it might be a part of our story, whatever. I'm not saying that's bad. But again, it shouldn't be the diet. It shouldn't be the diet of what we teach. Which leads to the third why. Focusing on the text reveals true authority. When you focus on the text, when you open the Bible, and you teach Scripture, you are saying to your listeners, What you believe 
is the true authority of life. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul says, And we also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. You heard it through humans, but it is the word of God. In other words, the confidence of the hearers was not in the, the, the preacher of the word, but the preaching of the word. It's a little line we like to use in our church just to remind everyone, like it's not about the preacher of the word, it's about the preaching of the word. It's about meeting with God. Now God uses us in wonderful ways. He's, he's saved us and he's called us and he's gifted us in all these unique ways and he uses our personality to mediate that truth. But friends, at the end of the day, I do not hope that 10 years on people say, I loved Tim's talks, but I love Jesus. And I'm thankful for what I learned about Jesus in my time that I was at that church. Yes, God uses our personality, but at the end of the day, it is only to be a signpost pointing to Christ. Focusing on the text reveals true authority. I was sharing this story with uh, Sarah, which was uh, hilarious to me. I attended this, this church environment in L.A. in the early days of planting a church, and the, the speaker got up there, and um, they gave this, like, brilliant TED Talk. It was, like, amazing. There wasn't anything particularly, like, Christian about it, but it was amazing, right? And then he had on a stool next to him uh, one of his books. It was, like, a new book that he had written. And then when he finally came to wanting to address something about, like, Christian scripture, he said, you know, there's a passage in, my, in, in the Bible that I put in my book and then he like pulls out his book and he opens in his book to the part where he quoted Ezekiel. <laughs> now, I don't know his intentions, intentions, God bless him. But what was communicated to me was it seemed like the Bible was a little bit of an afterthought. Like, hey, in my book, which is available you know, at the tables over here, I, I quote this, this other great book. It's called The Bible. You might have heard of it. It's a bestseller, you know. And I was like, man, I... I think what we need to take to heart is we want people to know where we get our authority from. And when we focus on the text, when we exposit the text, you're all expositors. And as we're doing that, we're essentially communicating that we ourselves are not the authority, nor do these teachings come ultimately from our own opinion or our own experience, though our experience can help illustrate and apply, but and still, we are not the authority. But instead, we're driving our hearers to wrestle with the authority of God himself. So when it comes to the tricky topics like sexuality, money, power, I don't want people to think, oh, that's what Tim thinks. I want them to leave saying, that's what God says. Otherwise, people will say, well, that's just your opinion. And because the Bible is the authority, and I am not, it also produces great courage and boldness. I'm just the messenger. You're just the messenger. Even when it comes to topics that you yourself are not very experienced in. And I want to say to you, because this is a group of young preachers, the famous words of Paul, you've heard them many times to Timothy, but let no one despise you for your youth. Let no one despise you for your youth. Because the authority that you have ultimately comes from God. And so many of you have experienced times, and you will, where there's a topic where you're like, I don't really have a lot of personal experience in that. And that's okay. Do your best to preach the word. Give people the best understanding of what the word says about that topic. Just to quote John Stott again, who, those of you who know him, know that he was single his whole life. And he was often asked why, of all people, he was qualified to teach on marriage. 
And he replied by saying that Scripture is the authority. And as a preacher of the Bible, he regularly taught on things he had not personally experienced. And he quipped, I have to preach on death regularly, but as of yet, I have not died. (laughs) Focusing on the text reveals true authority. Though our experience can help flesh out the topic and help people understand how to apply it, which is great. But that's not what makes it authoritative. It's not my experience. It's the exposition of the text. There is power in your testimony. There is power in giving opportunity for a variety of voices from different backgrounds to share. But ultimately, the goal is to hear God's voice, not just our voice. There's another value of this, and not just for the preacher but for the people you are teaching. Number four, focusing on the text promotes biblical literacy. Focusing on the text promotes biblical literacy. And this is an important point. Paul writes again to young Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, 13, until I come, do what? Devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. I want to spend a moment on this. I think it's really important, especially for our day and age. As you explain and expose your people to biblical texts in your talks, your sermons, whatever the context, you emphasize and model how to understand the Bible in daily life. Hopefully, in our teaching, we're helping them to observe the context and the language of a passage and to discover its meaning and application in your talks. You're modeling for them what hopefully they will do on their own. They're becoming familiar with the Bible for themselves. One of the criticisms on focusing on the text and working through passages is that it often fails to show the unity of the whole Bible or the different doctrines of the Bible. But I would say that expository teaching, when, does, when done rightly, does precisely that. Because your job, when you're unpacking a passage, you're meant to draw attention to the whole Bible's storyline. That's a part of what you're doing when you're laboring and you're studying. And some of you are volunteer, and some of you are bivocational, whatever it is. The work that you put into those talks absolutely matters. That's why Paul likens it unto farmers, you know, working in the the field and soldiers going out to battle. Like you are doing the work behind the scenes to show people how to understand the Bible for themselves. When taught rightly, you help the listeners see the doctrine, see the bigger themes. I mentioned marriage. Ephesians 5 is perhaps the most famous. Like what a beautiful text to connect to the whole Bible storyline, like God and his people from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible begins with a wedding and it ends with a wedding. What a beautiful story. As you go through passages, as you work through these paragraphs and books, part of your job is to promote biblical literacy because we've all seen the problem of biblical illiteracy. You see it on social media all the time, right? Like just the, the odd verse taken out of context, you know, just to kind of post on their workout routine. You know, like lunges, I can do all things through Christ. I'm like, I don't know if Paul had CrossFit in mind when he was writing his letter to Philippians. Sorry, I just surfaced any CrossFitters in, in, in the room. Your other evangelistic opportunity. Right? We've seen it all the time, and that's probably one of the, the most commonly, you know, misapplied passages. Or, you know, Jeremiah, like, what is it? The plans I have for you, future and a hope. It's the coffee cup verse, right? You're like, just, you know, there with your coffee cup in the morning. You're like, you do know that was written in the context of exile, right? You know, like, they're in Babylon. It's not a good situation, but, you know, that's important. My friend uh, Dave Lomas, who's the pastor for preaching at Reality San Francisco, he has this big um, water jug, and there's a sticker on it that says, Jesus never said that. 
And I was like, I want that sticker. That's a fun sticker. It's a good conversation starter because so many people attribute, you know, these sayings. They're like, yeah, Jesus never said that. Or when he did say that, that's certainly not what he meant. There's a problem of biblical illiteracy. People don't know how to understand the Bible. But you, you young preachers, the Spirit of God is sending you out to preach the Word of God that they might have a better understanding of how to study the Bible for themselves. And one of the greatest conversations that, that I get to have as I live longer is I meet these people who used to go to my church, and I love it when they don't say, oh, I love your sermons. You're so funny. Like, like I learned how to study the Bible. I learned how to follow Jesus at your church. I'm like, there's that great quote said by a man with a great name, Count von Zinzendorf. Preach the gospel, die, be forgotten. Goals. <laughs> Preach, die, be forgotten. I just want people to know the word of God. I want them to understand how to study the Bible. Where is it that you see the need for biblical literacy? And how do you think your teaching can help? But ultimately, what is this all about? And this is where we land. Finally, focusing on the text leads to Jesus Christ. Focusing on the text leads to Jesus Christ. Is that slide there? I don't know. There it is. If expository preaching is about understanding and explaining the context of passages, chapters, books, then we absolutely must place every talk, every sermon in the context of what the Bible is all about. It's all about Jesus. And so in our passage that we read at the beginning, Jesus did what? Explained to them what was said in all of scripture concerning himself doing the work of unpacking the Bible, focusing on the text, expository teaching, when done rightly, will always lead to Christ. And leading people to Christ is what brings the change. And so it was that when the disciples were on that road to Emmaus, they realized that they had been with Jesus and they reflected on being in his presence and said famously, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked and opened the scriptures to us? Our hearers need Jesus. The Bible is all about Jesus. If you want to know Jesus, you need to know the Bible. To know and understand Jesus, we need the scriptures. And to know and understand the scriptures, we need the power and illumination of the Holy Spirit. And for people to hear it, we need preachers like you. What a glorious task God has given to you. To preach Christ from all of scripture. That is why we must be equipped for this work. That's why you're here. That's why we're here today. That's why Sarah and Amy had this great idea of like, we just want to pass on the convictions of scripture to you that you might be encouraged and emboldened to preach. And I just share this from a personal perspective of how this worked out in my life. When I was a newer Christian, I had gone to Bible college only because it was cheap and I didn't want to go into ministry. It was a cheap Bible college in Southern California, so I literally said I needed to get out of the Bay Area. I'm going to move down there. Someone gave me a copy of Martin Lloyd-Jones' book, Preaching and Preachers. And I was like, why are you giving me this? Like, I don't want to be a preacher. But as I read that book, it came to a chapter, which was based on one verse out of Romans 10. How shall they hear without a preacher? And in that moment, the Holy Spirit said, Tim, you are called to preach. I was like, I am not going to, you know, the whole like bartering with God. No, no, no. You've got it all wrong. It's a, it's a thing in the Bible. <laughs> I share that because I sense that some of you are wrestling with this. 
and it could be that you're wrestling with it, not because God isn't prompting you toward it, but you're looking at your own ability. You're looking at your own adequacy. And it just might be today that the Holy Spirit says, you're going to go because I send you. And you're not going to preach your message. You're going to preach my message. You're going to preach Christ from Scripture. That's where you get the boldness. That's where you get the courage. That's where you get the confidence. And when people ask, well, what have you been talking about? This event you run, this church thing that you do, like, what are you preaching about? And you can say, well, we've been preaching about Jesus from all of Scripture, for all of life, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Just want to pray right now for you as we continue our day and just sit with this for a moment. Heavenly Father, I pray in this moment that your Holy Spirit would make these truths real to our hearts right now. I just sense that there needs to be in some of us a renewed confidence in the power of your spirit to do this and a renewed confidence in the power of your word that we need it, the world needs it, and that you've called us to preach it. I pray these men and women would leave here with boldness and courage filled with the spirit who can't even wait to open up the word again and to preach with power and authority that comes from you. So Spirit of God, would you deposit these truths into our heart as we process in Jesus' name? Amen. I'm going to put a question I think might be on the screen that I'd love in our discussion time um, for you to discuss with your neighbor. Maybe it's not on there. I'm just going to say it. Out of those five, which one resonated the most with you? And how are you challenged to include that in the teaching that you're doing now? So which one of those five resonated with you? And how are you challenged to include and focus that in your teaching this week? So I'm going to invite Sarah uh, to come up. We're going to have some time to, to discuss and to chat and I'm going to leave. Okay, great. Well, right? Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Does anyone else already just feel full? <laughs> like, I, please don't go home, but we could go home and it would be a great time. Um, okay, I'm just going to do a couple of quick housekeeping things before we go into break. We've intentionally built today with some chunky breaks because our hope is that in this room, you might 